I'm Renee Burton. I'm the head of threat intelligence here at InfoBlox. I'm happy to talk to you today about persistent actors that we see within DNS environments. So from an agenda perspective, I'm going to first introduce what is persistence and what does that mean within the DNS context. And then we're going to go through three specific examples of persistent actors that we are tracking at InfoBlox to give you a sense of the types of variety of actors that exist and uh, are able to maintain operations over a long period of time through their DNS infrastructure. And then finally, we'll talk briefly about the InfoBlox strategy for detection and response. So persistent infrastructure actors, what do I mean there? In, in this case, we're really focused on DNS and actors who are leveraging DNS, so domains and IP addresses, to manage a fairly large or complicated infrastructure. From a persistence perspective, we don't have a hard and fast rule, but generally speaking, we expect them to be active for at least a year. And their network should be somewhat complicated or evolving over that time. So an actor who has a single domain that happens to be three years old is not what we would necessarily call a persistent infrastructure actor. And our examples will really emphasize why we make these distinctions. Another aspect of the persistent infrastructure actor is that they're leveraging DNS to ensure that they have that persistence. So by changing up their domain names and their hosting services on a regular basis, they're able to evade detection and maintain operations for a long period of time. So let's look at these examples. I have three different examples that are quite different in how the actors operate and what their end goals likely are. The first one is Vextrio. So Vextrio is a massive malvertising network. We've been tracking them for a year and a half now, and we wrote a long paper on them in August 2022. Vectrio effectively compromises websites to deliver a variety of different kinds of malware and scams. So if we look at Vectrio specifically, it's often called adware, and it is a classic example of how adware in the security community is underestimated. If the community doesn't understand what something is, and particularly if it's very common, they'll just label it as adware or nuisanceware. But in fact, we know that these actors are able to use this so-called adware to distribute all kinds of things. So in the case of Vectrio specifically, we know that they deliver a variety of different kinds of malware, stealing financial information and credentials from users. They also do deliver ads and scams, in particular gift card scams, and they've been known to do spear phishing attacks as well. As an example of the kinds of impacts that a network like Vectrio can have, Nozomi Networks, who specializes in IoT security, published a paper in December of 2022 discussing a malware that had resurfaced called Gloopteba. And that malware is one that impacts IoT devices, but in fact, it was being delivered by Vectrio. Again, an example of a malvertising network that uses DNS to maintain its persistence. It's been around since spring of 2021, and we're monitoring them and have 100% coverage of their networks. Another example is a network we call OpenTangle. It's a lookalike phishing network. OpenTangle specializes in phishing. That's really all they do. And they use lookalike domains. So meaning that they have domains that look like a variety of other things. They are very brazen. They use SMS messages. And if you live in the United States, Canada, Australia, or Europe, you're very likely to have experienced OpenTangle. They are very broad and untargeted in their attacks with the hope that people are going to click on those lookalike domains. So some of the examples that we can see here are ones associated with tax systems for Australia. We see the US tax system, the IRS, but we also see a lot of banks, Citibank here, MTB Bank, and then government support type operations. We also track OpenTangle and we have 100% coverage on their domains. The third example here is a mercenary spy network. Amnesty International released a report about nation state persistent threats in which a commercial entity 
is selling the ability to exploit phones using zero day attacks against Android devices. These include spyware, and this type of attack is most commonly associated with the system Pegasus, which was discovered a few years ago. This allows people to track both the private messaging, video calls, emails of their targets. And because of the way that these mercenary operations work, we know that in the past they have targeted political adversaries as well as universities and government entities. The interesting thing about this kind of actor is that they're hiding in the low profile of DNS. They're very hard to detect. They only require a single DNS query to gain access to a device and maintain that access over time. What we found from the Amnesty International reporting was that Infoblox had already flagged 89% of the domains through our suspicious domains algorithms. Finally, if we look at those three different examples of persistent infrastructure actors, malvertising very large, constantly moving networks, which are able to deliver malware ad scams, and they are able to persist for multiple years. That's one type, and we have a lot of malvertising networks that we are tracking and monitoring. Another one is phishing. They're using lookalike domains to target a very widespread audience. They're hoping that a very small number of people will go to the link and provide their credentials. We are also tracking a variety of actors who specialize in that type of thing, and they're constantly growing and changing their network. And that third type we showed was exactly the opposite. It is a very small network that requires a very little amount of DNS that's very low profile, but they're able to maintain persistence over a long period of time on the devices that they're targeting. So how is Infoblox able to control and monitor all of these? In the end, our intelligence is designed for DNS. We detect, track, and block persistent threats via DNS. We say we do DNS all day, every day, and that's all we're doing. We're not trying to reverse engineer a bunch of malware. We're not scanning the internet for phishing pages. We're using our expertise in threat intelligence DNS and how it exists in the wild to locate threats before they happen. Our goal is to design intelligence for DNS, which allows our customers to block and forget so that threats do not ever occur on their network. We also don't want them to worry about false positives that cause network outages. We take very seriously the network performance. We're very concerned about the balance between the ability to have network performance and network protection. Our suspicious block lists are proactively designed to block threats before they're known through malware or the rest of the industry. We also have lookalike domain monitoring that is designed to protect those assets that customers care about most. To give you a sense of how effective this approach of DNS designed Intel, where we're doing DNS all day, every day, and that's what we do, Infoblox have flagged over 4 million suspicious domains between January and March 2023. And in that time period, we had one false positive escalation reported. That kind of success rate is due specifically to our expertise in DNS and intelligence, as well as our visibility into global DNS. Thanks so much. I hope you learned a little bit about persistent actors and how they differ in their visibility within DNS. These actors are particularly nefarious because they can exist for such a long period of time without anyone really noticing them. Hopefully, as we shine more light on the importance of DNS as part of the security stack, there will be stronger and better defenses against them.